San Francisco. This is Arab Talk with Jess and Jamal. I'm Jess Khan Nam. And I'm Jamal Dejani. Well, Jamal, we have a really interesting show today. You're going to be speaking with the founder of the Palestine Museum in the United States, uh, Mr. Faisal Salah, who is the founder of this museum. Uh, it's in Woodbridge, Connecticut, and uh, he has a very compelling story, and uh, it's it's going to be really interesting to hear about it. But afterwards, I'm telling you the 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 kind of emergence of more progressive elements within the Democratic Party is highlighting the hypocrisy of U.S. foreign policy when it comes to Palestine. Because on the one hand, we're finding out that the U.S. Uh, State Department is going to sanction the Egyptians for, quote, human rights abuses and withhold some of the hundreds of millions of dollars they send to the Egyptians. Yet, they continue to fund the apartheid uh, state of Israel on a regular basis who are committing atrocities, human rights violations, and you know, acts of terror and torture against uh, political Palestinian political prisoners. So you have the squad, AOC, Rashid Tlaib, and others who want to stop shipments of these massive uh, human destroying bombs to the uh, to the Israeli uh, military, and they're getting they're getting pushback. You know, so we're going to be talking about the political kind of divide that's happening now, not not between Democrats and Republicans, Jamal, but within the Democratic Party, between the progressive forces and the forces who are still committed to supporting in, a, in apartheid practice. That's right, Jess. And as you know, U.S. foreign aid has conditions. It's conditional. It to, always does. Yeah. You know, you're not, you're not supposed to give foreign aid to countries that violate uh, human rights. That's one of the conditions. You're not supposed to use military aid to bomb children and civilians. That's another condition. And so we'll examine this. And, uh, of course, uh, first we're going to go to our interview with uh, great person Faisal Saleh, someone who dedicated his life. I mean, this wasn't his career, really. Right. Uh, right. And... and basically established a very important and a very unique museum, the Palestine Museum in Woodbridge, Connecticut. Uh, let's uh, watch the interview. The Palestine Museum in Woodbridge, Connecticut was founded in 2018 as a labor of love by Faisal Saleh. Faisal's family of 11 children were made refugees from their ancestral home and extensive fruit orchards in Salama on the outskirts of Jaffa during the 1948 Nakba. Saleh's family fled to Albire in the West Bank, and this is where Faisal grew up until coming to the United States on an academic scholarship and later received his bachelor's from Oberlin, Oberlin followed by an MBA from the University of Connecticut. Joining us on Arab Talk is the visionary and founder, Faisal Saleh. Welcome, Faisal. Thank you, Jamal. Pleased to be with you. So how did you come up with the idea of establishing the Palestine Museum? Uh, what brought you to open an art museum since on the surface it's completely unrelated to your background? Well, uh, I uh, was in the U.S. Uh, for such a long time uh, and, and did all my time. I, I spent it working, keeping my nose to the grindstone, like they say. Uh, and uh, after uh, being there like 45 some years, I felt it was time to do something for Palestine. And I uh, kind of looked around to see, you know, what's there to do and what might be interesting. Not, not much really um, uh, caught my attention. Uh, uh, at some point, uh, I came across some people who were trying to start a museum for several years. I joined briefly and then quickly realized, uh, you know, they're, they're not on the right track. And so I struck out on my own in 2017, spent about uh, nine months uh, building the idea of the museum. And uh, nine months later, uh, I opened the Palestine Museum U.S., uh, in April of 2018. So now it's three years from your opening of the museum. Uh, how has the public response been? I mean, one nice touch you have is the videography 
of visitors talking about their experience? Um, the response has been great. And uh, over the three years, the museum evolved from being uh, a local institution in a small town called Woodbridge outside of New Haven, Connecticut, to being uh, more uh, of a global institution. Uh, thanks to the COVID crisis, uh, we, as long, along with the rest of the world, have discovered the advantage of virtual technology. And uh, the museum was able to capitalize on that quickly and uh, developed a, a great uh, international audience in many countries. Uh, so um, the museum uh, was extremely well received, uh, not just by members of the Palestinian community in the United States, but also by uh, Americans uh, in general. Uh, our audience has been uh, about half uh, of Palestinian uh, origin and the other half uh, uh, non-Palestinian, non-Arab uh, origin. And, these, uh, and, and those statistics are really great. Uh, uh, they are what we were after. Uh, and we continue to cater to both audiences. Um, the museum is very well known, uh, not just in the United States, but also in many of the countries in Europe and um, and uh, in, in the Middle East and Palestine in particular. Um, this year, we are working on a, a very ambitious uh, art project, which is to create uh, a presence uh, at the Venice Biennale, uh, which is the, the world's greatest art event. Wow, but, that's impressive. Yeah. And... We expect to be there when the Benali opens in April of 2022. So, you know, we, uh, I say we, Palestinians, uh, and living in diaspora, uh, carry the, the Nakba with us, that's uh, the catastrophe. I noticed that you have a time since Nakba timer on your website. Uh, I mean, explain to me what's the message behind that time since Nakba? Yeah, first of all, uh, we like to call it the Nakba clock. Uh, like this, you have the doomsday clock, and then there's the <laughs> Nakba clock. And that, the Nakba clock is ticking. When you go on our website, you see it second by second, the seconds are ticking by. Each second, it's another slice of time that Palestinians have been deprived of their homeland. And uh, our losses and damages uh, are accumulating on a daily basis. There is a value uh, for what we've lost, and, and, and there is a cost for it. Uh, so far, we have been suffering the cost. Uh, there will come a day when we will uh, demand uh, reimbursement for our damages, and the clock is tracking what those damages will be. So, I mean, through your exhibit, do you feel you have enough pieces of that clock? I mean, I, I uh, let me just uh, say that I have not been to the museum. I've studied it through your website. The, the person who told me about your museum when you first opened was my wife. She's from New England, and she's from the Boston. She actually drove with her mother to your museum, you know, when pre-COVID, let's put it this way, when things were open. And, and I'm trying to kind of like, if, if someone would come there, where do you take them on their journey? Um, we take them on a, a variety of stops. And uh, it's not that we present uh, a fully detailed, sequential, chronological history of events, et cetera, but rather we show... Uh, certain images and certain views uh, that are carefully curated uh, that when they're put all together, uh, they create a very moving image, uh, whether you're a Palestinian or a, or, or a non-Palestinian, and they convey the message that Palestinians have been uh, uh, subject, subjected uh, to all kinds of injustices and Palestinians have uh, artists uh, and talented people, just like any other people. Uh, and 
we are human and deserve to be treated as humans and we should uh, be, be treated like humans. Uh, the message is complex uh, and it's not delivered directly. Uh, it is delivered through the arts and uh, we define the arts very broadly. We have identified 13 uh, different types of arts that the Palestinians excel at and the museum uh, goes to great lengths to feature uh, those different arts. Uh, we recently uh, declared uh, the last week of April as Palestine Art Week, and we have now reserved that on the, on the calendar. Uh, and each uh, Palestine Art Week uh, includes seven days of intensive uh, programming about Palestinian arts. And just uh, so people know what I'm talking about, uh, we see the arts not just as paintings and sculptures, uh, but also as photography, as calligraphy, as music, uh, cuisine, uh, dance, debke, embroidery, uh, poetry, uh, literature, novels, uh, you name it. We, we have 13 different forms of that art that we celebrate in where Palestinians uh, excel at. And we want the world to, to know the depth and extent to which Palestinians uh, excel in these arts. So the artists that you feature, I mean, are they, uh, do they live in the United States or you just seek out artists from everywhere, from Palestinians in diaspora in Europe, in the Middle East, or even from Palestine? We have artists from all around the world. Uh, we have artists from the United States, from Europe, uh, from Chile, uh, we have artists uh, from Palestine, and Palestine, as you know, has different uh, segments uh, uh, from the West Bank, artists from Gaza, artists from the pre-48 Palestine. Uh, we have artists from uh, Jordan, from, from Syria and Damascus, from Lebanon, uh, and, and some other countries. Uh, we make no distinction uh, uh, to the place where Palestinians reside. We reside all over the world. Uh, the entire planet uh, is our, our residence. Uh, as you know, we scattered everywhere in the diaspora. So the residence is not important. Uh, we want to all be seen as Palestinians uh, without any distinctions among us based on uh, our uh, uh, residences. Uh, you know, Palestinians hold dozens and dozens of different kind of passports. The passports we hold are immaterial. Uh, yeah, what's in our heart is Palestine, and that's what we want people to know. Do you face difficulties uh, bringing these uh, artists uh, or, or their work to the United States? Not whatsoever. I, I can bring a piece of art from Gaza in four days. Wow, that's impressive. Uh, yeah, I can bring uh, a piece of art from Kuwait in two days, from Dubai, from uh, Belgium, from Luxembourg. Uh, we have artists in all those places and we're able to get the art from there. Uh, we, we have not uh, experienced any difficulty. There's one place that's, that's kind of a, a bit, uh, takes longer to get it from, which is uh, Damascus and, and, and Beirut, uh, because there are some shipping restrictions on those countries, uh, in which case the artwork gets shipped to somebody in Dubai, and from Dubai we ship it to the United States. What is the most unanticipated thing you have experienced or, or learned during this adventure, really? Uh, believe it or not, I didn't realize that there were so many talented Palestinians around. Uh, uh, I knew we have a lot of talented people. I know we had a lot of artists, but I had no idea how many artists there are and how many filmmakers there are, how many novelists, how many writers. Uh, there are thousands and thousands of thousands. Uh, you know, uh, it, it is incredible uh, the amount of talents Palestinians have. And uh, it, it is time for the world to begin to uh, to know that talent.
Uh, I mean, we have opera singers like you won't believe. Uh, we 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 brought in uh, an opera singer, uh, Mariam Tamari, to perform at the French Embassy in Washington D.C. In an incredible performance, she sang in six languages, uh, and uh, she amazed everybody in the audience. We brought uh, pianists, world class pianists. Uh, uh, to perform uh, in, in multiple locations. Uh, and uh, we have the talent. Uh, we just need to be able to present it to people in a way that capitalizes on the talents and not diminish it by the other extraneous things that some of us often uh, do uh, and, and try to uh, and end up kind of self-defeating the, the purpose. Uh, uh, what's really important from in the arts world is to focus on Palestinians as artists. Uh, and that is the message we want to get through. Uh, yes, we're Palestinians, uh, but we don't need to carry flags everywhere. Uh, the fact we're Palestinian is, is just as powerful. The flag is something in addition, uh, but it's, it's more important for people to see us as Palestinian as artists, as talented people, because that is the message we are trying uh, to, to deliver to the world. We're not the helpless victims, um, and, and we're not the terrorists, we're, we're not the extremists. We're people just like anybody else, and there's no question about that, and we're out there to show people that's who we are. Would you say that this uh, journey took you uh, to your own uh, self e experience and discovery, because you've mentioned that you 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 were surprised to find about so many artists and talented people. So, did you learn more about your own culture? Of course, uh, every every day I learn more things. Uh, every day I meet a new a new artist. I, I meet so many people. I can't really remember all the names. I have to write them down. Uh, and I get calls from people and say, hi, Faisal, how are you? And uh, I said, uh, please, uh, could you tell me who you are? <laughs> <laughs> and of course, when you get my age, you know, you, you know, memory becomes a, <laughs> becomes a little bit of a factor in, in, in remembering things. However, uh, I enjoy spending hours on the phone with Palestinians in, in different parts of the world talking about Palestine and reminiscing about such and such street in Ramallah and which such a building and where we used to walk around and uh, what stores were nearby and, and kind of going through my a map of, of Ramallah in my head in El Bire and, and remembering all the shopkeepers, all, all the stores, all the times we've had there, the teachers. We, I had the uh, the students who were my classmates, and and it just brought all that stuff back. And of course, it reminded me of my family and my parents. And and I, I, I realized things now in hindsight that I didn't know when I was living there. When I'm living there, I didn't realize the depth of anguish uh, that my parents had and the frustration over you know losing their their land and not being able to uh to make a good living uh and all the challenges of raising 11 children um uh just to give you uh, an example in 1967 we were uh run over by the israeli army during the 67 war and after that you know we were able to travel back to palestine where we from and of course, I wasn't there. I was born afterwards. But so I went with my parents uh, in a taxi to visit our village. We got out of the taxi. And for two minutes, my parents looked around where our house used to be. Uh, and then they ran back in the taxi and says, let's get out of here. We can't take it. They could not stand being there. Uh, it's just uh, that level of anguish is, is un, un, unimaginable um, and the level of, of pain that, that our parents suffered without talking about it. They never, they've talked about the good times they had there, but they never talked about the pain that they suffered. 
Actually, this is a, <clears throat> a very common theme. Uh, I went with my uh, father, actually, to look at the home in, in Jerusalem, the house he grew up, and it, it, it was a very emotional experience, even though the house still exists and, of course, occupied now. But then <clears throat> I know people who uh, in, in the States have resisted going back. Uh, people who came here uh, after the Nakba and they haven't been to Palestine because they said they want to keep their old memories. Mm -hmm. I mean, do you feel there is an escape when people come to your museum kind of looking at paintings and old photographs and, and things like this? That, that Does that take them back? Uh, are they in a way find the museum as a sanctuary for their for their good memories? Yes, uh, and more so than that. Uh, uh, when, when they walk into the museum, uh, they, they tell us, you have great things in the museum and on the walls, but you could have had just, you know, uh, shreds of burlap on the walls, and we would, have, we would have loved it. He says, you know, this is the only place that's ours. For, for years and years and years, we went to other people's museums. Uh, you know, uh, we didn't have any. And so they feel that they're back to something that belongs to them. It's, just, it's, it's part of the identity that they, 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 they have been longing for, belonging and having things that belong to us. Uh, and this is one of the new things. And a lot of people come and say, uh, Oh, this is like being in Palestine when they see all these photographs from 1920 and 1930 and 1944 uh, and, and see, you know, our ancestors who were living there, uh, who were resisting the British. And they see, you know, Palestinians injured in demonstrations against the British and lying on the ground. They say it's like being in Palestine today. Have you been to the um, the Waldorf Hotel in Bethlehem? That's the uh, that the museum that was put together by Bansky. Do you see any? If you've been there, or has have anyone have people mentioned to you that there are similarities between the two? Uh, they haven't mentioned similarities. Uh, I haven't been there because the last time I was in Palestine was in 1999. And I don't think it was there at the time. And I did visit Palest I did visit Bethlehem at that time and uh, went over the in Jerusalem, et cetera. But I, I really don't know a whole lot about it other than what I read on social media and what I see. Um, but th th there is something different about the Palestine Museum US than any other museum. It, it is it is not run and designed and operated just like any other museum. You know, we have certain approaches. Uh, we we want to uh, try to represent the largest number of Palestinian artists we can. Uh, we look for excellence, uh, but we have a, a bigger mission and a bigger uh, goal to accomplish than most museums do. Did you face any difficulties? We know when Palestinians put something together to discuss Al Nakba, even a lecture at 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 uh, at the university campus, they face resistance. Did you face any resistance? Uh, I, I have I have not I have not encountered any resistance. Uh, we've never had any of our programs censored. Uh, we put on daring programs. Uh, we screened the film Janine Janine, for instance, uh, which is banned in Israel. Uh, we screen a lot of a lot of films about the Nakba. Uh, we've screened films uh, that were made by the PLO in Lebanon in the uh, in the late '70s, early '80s, uh, and we, we've never had any uh, any any trouble. Uh, no, nobody's ever. Uh, challenge what we're doing or, or try to stop us. We uh, we have an exhibit of Gaza children's drawings from the Operation Cast Lead in 2008, 2009, though, that for eight years, people tried to exhibit it in the US and nobody could because Israel would shut it down every time through their supporters. Uh, the last attempt was at Oakland Children's uh, Museum. Right. Uh, 
where the exhibit was canceled a week before it opened. Now we we ended up with all those drawings. Uh, they're like hot potatoes, and they've been on exhibit in the museum since the day we opened. Uh, and uh, we have not had any uh, any. Uh, we are a museum. Uh, we display art. Uh, and, you know, we, uh, we don't get challenged. Uh, we are telling the Palestinian story through the arts, uh, and I have not had any difficulty doing that whatsoever. Well, this is great because, I mean, I've witnessed um, these challenges uh, by the Israel lobby and their supporters in the U.S., and uh, also by... Uh, revisionist historians that uh, especially when it comes to discussing uh, something about al nakba really yeah i think it may have something to do with how we present the, our material uh, like for instance uh, we have a mosaic uh, of razan and najar uh, and, and as a memorial for her we have a huge 15 foot wide uh, memorial for rachel corey uh, and nobody ever said anything about any of those things. And uh, I, I, I'm, look, I, I, I'm happy to address any challenge of, of the Rachel Corey uh, Memorial. Uh, so this is a young lady, an American girl, went to, uh, to support Palestinians in Gaza, and the Israeli bulldozers killed her. We have a memorial for her. Anybody has a question about that? Come talk to me. Tell us about the silent auction of uh, Palestinian art in saving lives uh, in Palestine taking place, I know, in, in the Bay Area uh, this week and in Orinda. Orinda, yes. Uh, we were uh, approached by a couple of people, asked us if we would uh, par participate and help with that. And we uh, immediately agreed to co-sponsor the event and uh, provide uh, um, a small art exhibit on site there, but a big... Uh, art show uh, as in the form of a, an, an online virtual auction, uh, which went live um, uh, Sunday night, and it is running right now. Um, and uh, it, we have artists from all over the place, and uh, there are two types of art that's being offered in the auction, uh, original artwork, uh, and also uh, prints and posters which tend to be of a, of a very affordable price. You know, they start like around $50, they go 100, 200, up to 500. And the, uh, the original artwork obviously starts at more like 1500, $2,000 going up uh, as much as uh, 10,000 or, or more. Uh, but the artwork is excellence and all that artwork is residing at the Palestine Museum currently. And uh, we have twice as much artwork as we have space for, and we do have about 8,000 square feet of exhibit space at the museum. Uh, it, it, it's not a small place. Uh, so we hope people uh, would be interested in participating in the auction and supporting the cause for which the auction is, is dedicated. Uh, uh, I um, was wondering if, uh, I guess people can go to the museum's website and we will have uh, information there, uh, but they, they can't. And, and the website is? PalestineMuseum.us. We'll, we'll, we'll do that. We'll put, we'll put, we'll put a link on our, uh, our website, but people also should learn about your, about the auction. And we, we should, definitely, people should learn more about your museum, yeah. going to your website, PalestineMuseum.us. Dot US. Well, I uh, I wish you the best luck. I think uh, I think it's it's a great thing, uh, and I want to thank you, Faisal Saleh, for coming on Arab Talk. Thank you so much. Great pleasure. Hope to see you again. Bye bye. Well, that's the voice in the face of Faisal uh, Saleh, who is the founder and you know um, kind of the person who's breathed life, blood, and money into the founding of the Palestine Museum in the United States in Woodbridge, Connecticut. It's it's a compelling story, Jamal, and you know, it brings to light the the kind of awesome history of artists, of poets, of 
the artistry of Palestinians, not only in Palestine, but in the diaspora. And now we have a home here in the United States for some of that history. Hopefully it won't get bombed uh, in ways that other of our uh, of our precious historical uh, artifacts and memories have had to go through in the last 73 years. But this is a great story. You know, the interesting thing uh, that if you go to the website, which is the palestinemuseum.us, which I urge everyone to go there, the first thing that you'll notice is uh, the a Nakba clock. Right. And, and that's the first thing you turn on. It's like he has his countdown starting from the Nakba. How many years, how many days, how many, how many months, how many days, how many hours? And which I find uh, very unique, but basically he uh, tries to reconstruct really the rich Palestinian history from different sources, be it arts, poetry, music, photography, right. uh, Palestinians living in diaspora, Palestinians living in Palestine. He gets things from all over, from Gaza, even though you know how difficult it is to get right. things out of Gaza. He gets them right here in the, in the United States. Uh, he's a very busy man, and it's, it's a, it's a but very- But this is a lifelong passion, Jamal. This is not something, this is not his job, but this is his lifelong passion. He's someone who came to the United States like everyone else, uh, got his- uh, finished his university studies, got his master's degree, built a career, became very successful. And you know what? He's Mets, giving back. He's giving back. He this is this is his whole idea, you know, and it's uh, brilliant. And we have to give him a lot of credit. And by the way, you know, if you go to that website, palestinemuseum.us, there are ways to support the museum, which we encourage our listeners to do. And also they have a special event, which we talk about it, which is happening in the Bay Area at Orinda, uh, to be specific. And this will be posted, details about this event will be de will be posted on our website. And also we talked about it. So um, I highly recommend supporting the museum, its endeavors, its work. Go online, and hopefully if you're in New England or in New York or wherever, it's not too difficult to to go to to Wood, Woodbridge, where you and I are kind of far, three thousand miles away. But if you're on the East Coast, it's very accessible. Well, here's the thing: I've been to Woodbridge, <laughs> so I know Woodbridge. Ironically, it's a actually it's a very beautiful suburb, you know, outside of you know where Yale University is. It's very pretty, very beautiful, and it's a perfect place. Well, you know, know. now you're on, on your next trip to the East Coast, Jess, and We're I'm gonna I'm go. gonna I'm make it a go I'm making it a goal to go there. Me you too. know, uh, Winifred, my wife, she's been there. That's wow. how I learned about it, and she drove from Boston to go to the museum. Wow. Of course, this was pre-COVID. Uh, you know, when yeah. people could go around, and so hopefully when travel becomes easier and, and, and then we'll get to see it. But in the meantime, go to the website. There's a lot exactly. on that website. I mean, yeah, everything it's, is it's done a beautiful now virtually. And the history that he's documenting is just awesome. And, um, you know, I made that comment in the beginning about I hope it doesn't get, um, you know, bombed or destroyed. It was only half a joke, Jamal, because you and I both know, historically, one of the things that the Israelis have done is to try to erase our history by bombing libraries, museums, documents. They've done that historically. They've tried to, you know, change the names of Arab cities and given them Hebrew names or, you know, streets that have Arab names and changing them into Hebrew. I mean, all this kind of. Well, that's why Faisal preserves this, right? Exactly. That, that's his mission, really. Right. So we need to give him as much support as possible. We encourage our listeners to go to the website, see the museum and do what you can to support the Palestine Museum. All right, so uh, you're listening to Arab Talk on KPOO San Francisco. We're moving to our next topic, Jazz. I wanna ask you a 